Hello, hello. Hi. What an interesting moment to be having this conversation. Um, and what an interesting person to be having this conversation Likewise. with. Likewise. Let me begin by saying thank you, Sherilyn, for your work. Thank you. Um, thank you. For the room, uh, you are a warrior who never tires. Well, I get tired. But you don't show it. You don't show it. You, don't show it. you speak truth to power. And just, just to sort of set the tone for the conversation, if I can, um, the U.S. Census projects that by 2045, more than half the population of this country will be people of color, and in many places, this future has already arrived well ahead of schedule. This happens as our country is facing a nativist backlash that is impossible to ignore and pervades really every arena of American life. In an area, in an era, excuse me, in an era where white supremacy is uplifted in ever more brazen ways and interrogated with ever more emboldened vigor, this allows us at this moment in our conversation to reflect on histories of resistance and our current reality of shifting narratives and colliding realities. If this moment feels divisive, it is because it is. If this moment feels challenging, it is and it should be. If we find ourselves feeling a little bit hot under the collar, it is because the fire next time is burning right in front of us. And if you feel immune to this, it is not because you are protected from the heat. It is more likely that you have occupied a space in your brain that gives you a sense of protection, a sense of living in a safe space, even though the soles of your shoes are melting mm. and your lungs are constricting because the atmosphere is indeed acrid. So let's talk about this. Wait, first. <laughs> So we're here to talk about diversity, but let's sort of set the stage for that, because the idea of diversity has usually meant we are trying to blend people who are in a category that has been otherized for some reason into an American neighbor, na a narrative that is built around a white cultural default. So this is something we should know, but it, it, it I think bears repeating that the history of this country was really built around whiteness and white supremacy, yes? Without question, I mean, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here and thank you, the great Elizabeth Alexander, wherever she is, and uh, Michelle, that opening was just really powerful and perfect. And the reason I love it is because um, we can go a whole day without actually acknowledging that we are in a perilous moment. And I, I, I think it's so critical and so important that we honestly engage the fact that we are in a moment of tremendous crisis. We're in a moment of democratic crisis. Um, we're in a moment of national crisis. And we shouldn't forget it. So I thank you for describing the moment so powerfully. Um, and it's a moment of reckoning that will keep coming up until we reckon with this history that you've just described. Um, which is that the project of America is deeply grounded in race and racism and in white supremacy. And these are not bad words. Um, I know that it makes people feel uncomfortable to use these words. But I really want to invite you to come out of that discomfort and deal in reality and be mature enough as citizens to grapple with the realities that we have to grapple with, um, to be mature, grown-up citizens. Um, I, we don't have time for a full history lesson <laughs> on this, in this country. Um, but I will say that I think it bears at least beginning to think about what it means to have fought a civil war and to have amended our constitution in a way that literally constituted the second making of this country. It needed to be made over because it was imperfect. Um, so the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the constitution which were ratified uh, in 1866, 1868, and 1870, had to do some very important work. They had to end slavery. That's the 13th Amendment. Um, the 15th Amendment, I'm going to skip over 14th for a second, had to address the right to vote for um, black people, 1870. 
The 14th Amendment, which sits in the center of it, is, in my view, the most powerful, important part of the Constitution that most Americans don't feel comfortable with. Um, First, it establishes birthright citizenship. That's the first sentence. Any, any person born in this country or naturalized shall be a citizen of the United States and the state um, in which they reside. That is huge. It was necessary because of a, a decision called Dred Scott in 1850, which essentially removed citizenship not only uh, from African Americans who were enslaved, but even from those who were free. It basically said black people could not be citizens of the country. So black people were rendered stateless by that Dred Scott decision. And so it needed to be restored, citizenship needed to be created and restored, and it was in that first line of the 14th Amendment. The reason I invite you to think about the 14th Amendment is because that first line, which was targeted at slaves and, and free blacks who had been uh, rendered stateless, is actually responsible for the trajectory of the families of probably most of the people in this room. It created the 20th century America in which people could come across on a ship, could become naturalized and become citizens, and their children, if born here, would become citizens. The whole project of becoming American came out of this response to the issue of race and slavery. And then it goes on and talks about equal protection, which is the first and only place in the Constitution where equal protection of laws is described, and it says, that every person in, this, in the United States shall be entitled to equal protection. Not every citizen, every person, meaning if you are within the borders of this country, you are entitled to equal protection of laws. That means if you are undocumented, mm -hmm. that means if you are an immigrant who has not yet been naturalized, you are entitled to equal, look at the vision of that. And all of that was created over this entanglement over the issue of race and white supremacy. So even the country that you think you know, that you love, that you embrace, that, that is founded, you think, in these principles that elevate us above other countries in the world, that's the project of a do-over. Yeah. A do-over that happened after the Civil War to address the a, issue of a race. A reboot. A reboot. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is central to who we are. And that we have to fight this thing out regularly is part of who we are. And these are perilous moments. I don't mean to suggest that we should say, you know, every, every 100 years we gotta do this thing. I mean, in fact, I don't wanna say that because I wanna suggest to you that it's a very dangerous moment, that lives hang in the balance, uh, that the dignity of human beings lang uh, hangs in the balance. And it could have gone the other way. And it, and it can go, and it can yet go the other way, which is why the demographic figure that you describe, you know, I'm very fond of saying that demography is not destiny. Right? I know that people say, you know, we're, we're getting ready to be a majority minority country, if you believe in that terminology, um, or majority people of color. But demography is not destiny. It does not guarantee power. And so to, tho to, to those who are so nervous, the white supremacists who are so nervous that they'll be out of power, I would tell them, calm down, because you've been having a very good run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to those who are relaxed enough to think, oh yes, you know, it's going to be majority minority, I would say not so fast. Mm -hmm. There is such a thing as minority rule. And we're at a moment where we have to decide who we're going to be. I think when most people think about minority rule, they think about one country, right? What's the country you think about when you think about minority rule? Yeah. South Africa. Well, what does it take to, to make min minority rule happen? You have to have hyper-segregation. You have to suppress the votes of the majority. You have to have brutal law enforcement. And you have to have a narrative that dehumanizes the majority. So I, I, I don't take it uh, as a civil rights lawyer as, as something that is like inevitable. I mean, I do believe the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, but there can be a lot of suffering in the course of that bend. And so I, I, I think that when people talk about this uh, demographic change, I think it's important, but I do think we have to understand that the work that we have to do to uh, preserve this country as a democracy, and I use the word preserve lightly because we should be trying to transform this country into a better democracy. It's not like we were this great democracy 10 years ago and now we're terrible. We, we had a lot of problems then too. And it's constant work. And it's, con it's constant work. That's the, 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 the privilege of being a citizen in this country uh, has a cost. And the cost is your awakeness and your work as a citizen, and it means you show up and you, you are engaged in your community and you are fighting for the future of this country. 
And I think many people have lost a sense of that. Like it's like we had this civil rights movement and now here we all are and isn't it all wonderful? Uh, well, what, what made us think that we didn't have to do the work? We were privileged. Most of the people in this room, and I don't want to get in, be ageist or anything, but I'm guessing that most of the people in this room were born after World War II. Am I right about that? Most? Okay, so that's like a huge privilege, right? Because we were born at a time when not just this country, but the world was experimenting with liberal democracy. We came, we, we had these movements, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and so forth. And so we came of age in a very brief period of time in our history. It's just a slither of time. And we've come to believe that this is just how it, it inevitably, inevitably is supposed to be, and we don't have to do anything to preserve it. It's like a farmer who plants one good crop. You know, I remind people that like, if you, if you, if you imagine that American democracy doesn't really, can't really be said to truly exist until at least 1954. I mean, if you have by law kept a part of the population that, that are citizens from participating fully as citizens, I mean, and I could take it to 1965 if you kept most of that population from even voting. We've only been a democracy for a very you short period of time. You could take it even later than that. I could, I could, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be generous okay. and say, let's say 1965. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to give it 1954. Mm -hmm. That's 65 years. That would mean we've only been legally, on paper, a democracy for 65 years. And we're wondering why we're in this kind of strife. We haven't even been at this very long. So I, I, I do think that the moment that we're in really compels a kind of awakening of what it means to be a citizen in what is actually a truly ambitious experiment, which is this country. So a couple things. First, in honor of um, Elizabeth Alexander, who has convened us today. Yes. And, and as a professor is always thinking about how we can better educate ourselves, mm -hmm. I think uh, I've heard through the course of the conversations that there's a syllabus that you could almost put together from yeah. the day. And I just want to add to the syllabus around the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. the fun, wonderful work of Martha Jones. Yes, Birthright um, Citizen. Who's written a book called Birthright Citizen. As Sherilyn has asked you to learn more about that, I would just make a mark to yourselves to, to find that work because it explains it's excellent. it and its consequences um, at this moment in a beautiful way. You used a term um, that I just want to lean into a little bit. You talked about if white supremacists look at this moment. Mm -hmm. So there's white supremacists, but then there's white supremacy. Yes. And I just want you to talk a little bit about the difference because yes. those two things, be between those two things, because there are people who benefit from, you know, the word privilege gives people the bugaboos. You mentioned the word privilege, and all of a sudden a wall comes up mm -hmm. in conversation. Um, and the same thing around the word white supremacy, and yet it is a real concept. How do we find a space where we can talk about diversity and inclusion and equity mm -hmm. and really lean hard into what that means without casting people who, know, who do not see themselves that way, who perhaps are not that way, but benefit, mm -hmm. who are not white supremacists, but benefit from a history mm -hmm. and a reality and a, a legal and a structural system and sometimes a, a, a historic system that is built around preserving, projecting mm -hmm. um, white supremacy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the biggest mistake we make in thinking about white supremacy and in actually trying to address issues of race and racism in this country is um, you know, doing what we as Americans tend to do, which is like we love to talk about feelings. And so um, <laughs> we, we, we tend to ascribe what are really powerful structural dynamics and forces um, in, 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 into feelings, right? Into whether someone is a good person or a bad person. And I can just tell you as a civil rights litigator, you know, I'm not a, a faith leader. Um, I'm actually quite uninterested in the question of whether someone is a good person or a bad person. I'm interested in whether someone uh, is allowing themselves to operate within a structure that produces a result that we inevitably know what it's going to be because the structure was created for the purpose of maintaining a certain kind of power dynamic. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can be a white, a rabid white supremacist but what's more important is white supremacy, which is the structure that was created long before you were born and that many people benefited from and that you may be operating in and dismantling those structures. And our job, I always say as civil rights lawyers, is to have a kind of a third eye, to be able to see the scaffolding of what that looks like, of what those structures look like, and to be able to think through how to dismantle them and then to be able to create solutions for how you could create new structures that actually would be fair. So um, 
But you isn't know. it often dealing with, with something that's always shifting? I mean, social scientists <laughs> define racism as a sort of multi-dimensional, highly, highly adaptive system, a system that ensures unequal distribution of resources among racial groups and is controlled, that whoever controls the institution controls the distribution and embeds its racial bias and its interests into that system. And though you think it's one thing, the important term there is that it's highly adaptive, that it keeps changing. That's the way social scientists describe racism. Is that true also of systems of supremacy, is that they will shape shift in ways that make the work ever more difficult? That's the exact term. Actually, Charles Sherrod, who was a great civil rights activist and the husband of Shirley Sherrod, um, amazing couple in Georgia. I went to a conference when I was a baby civil rights lawyer many, many years ago, and I remember him saying that racism is a shapeshifter. And that um, this now goes back to my role as a civil rights lawyer. You know, my job, if, if you're in the horror movie genre and you know shapeshifters, is um, to see it in all its guises. Right? To be able to, you know, to see it, that it doesn't have to have a big stomach and a hat and a baton and look like Bill Connor, right? That you have to be able to see it in its guises. And it's fascinating what you just said because you just perfectly described the issue of algorithmic bias, mm -hmm. right? Which is how you can take the lessons and the apparatus of white supremacy and perhaps even without meaning to, embed it into a new system where it shows up in a new way, but it's actually the old thing, right? right? And amplifies and actually accelerates. Upon accelerates. It. accelerates. It's the yes. speed. It's the speed that makes it truly frightening. One of the things we do know about bias is that bias thrives in speed, right? That the more you slow things down, mm. the more you counter bias. Imagine somebody walks into this room, they're super tall, they have on a jersey and sneakers, you know, they're seven feet tall, and your first thought is, oh, that must be a professional basketball player, right? That's what you might think like that. But the person sits down, and they begin talking, and then they begin talking about the lab they work in, they, right? You, they, you get more information, and you realize that they're not a basketball player at all, they're an engineer, right? The, the, the snap judgment, the speed at which we make decisions is the place where our prejudices come out, and we all have prejudices, right? We all are organizing a lot of information in our head in a very short period of time, and we need those, we need, we need those shortcuts, and we use those shortcuts. So when we then add um, algorithms, and we then add machine learning to it, and we're talking about exponential speeds, mm -hmm. we're talking about taking bias to the next level, even beyond the next level, where it can replicate itself over and over again. It can process a thousand applications for that apartment and make decisions based on whatever were the algorithms that the one human being already embedded with their own prejudices put in to create that algorithm. And now they can do it, not by having one person come to the office and hand you an application and then you saw the person, you said, oh, well, sit down, let's have a conversation, right? But it can do it at that pace. So to, to bring the room into this, based on the work that I do at the Race Card Project mm -hmm. where I collect narrative mm -hmm. and learn quite a bit about how people react yeah. in the moment, there is a, you speak at the moment where someone walks in, he's tall, he's mm -hmm. got a jersey on, got a baseball cap, mm -hmm. wearing some fancy tennis shoes. Um, there's a, a card, uh, there's six word stories. There's a card that captures that moment. Lady, I don't want your purse. Hmm. <laughs> there it is. Which is a whole novel in six words, but it's written by a young man uh, named Hiawatha. He's a large black man and he says his size, his color, enters the room before he does. And what I like about this card is he's asking you to look at both sides of the equation. So if I can ask the audience mm -hmm, just a please. quick question. How many of you have entered a space, whether it's an elevator, a restaurant, you're walking down the street, um, and there aren't very many people and you encounter someone who doesn't look like you. Um, this, regardless of your color or your class or, or your, your geographic status, have had that experience and you don't even know why you do it but you pat your wallet or you pull your purse a little bit closer. How many of you have had that experience? Be honest. Mm -hmm. How many of you have had the experience where you walk down the street and someone tries to hit the lock on the car door? Mm -hmm. And you hear that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that loud, loud noise? Mm -hmm. Or you walk into an elevator and it just, your heart breaks because you see someone clutching. Mm -hmm. So imagine, that's, that's the brain mm -hmm. doing that. So imagine then a computer doing that because that's the shape shifting. Mm -hmm. That's where it jumps from, 
from air to gas, mm -hmm. you know, and it, right. and it moves in um, a much more effective way. That's right, that's right. So, when, you know, that, that's part of the moment we're in too, right, is that it's not just that we're in a perilous political moment and a transitioning demographic moment and a moment of tremendous wealth inequality and the, um, a moment of shamelessness, you know, which I think is important for us to pause and think about also, you know, uh, shame in your personal life is maybe not a great thing, but societal shame has its value. And, you know, in the civil rights movement, it was actually pretty powerful, yeah. right? Yes. Um, we, we're in entering a time of, of no shame, right? Where anything can be explained away. Uh, and, and, and even being a flagrant racist is not embarrassing um, or publicly unacceptable, at least to some people. And to others, it's kind of like the cost of the ticket, but the economy is good, you know? So, um, we, 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 are in a, we are in a very, very difficult moment in which we have to suss out all of these pieces. And that mo part of that moment is that at the same time that we need to pause and figure out who do we really want to be, we have all of this technology that's speeding things up incredibly quickly that we all want access to so that we can try to make that 25th hour of the day happen. So when we're talking about trying to figure out how to create a system of equality, mm -hmm. we often turn to diversity and inclusion programs. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we need new terms and a new paradigm for a moment like this. And I, I often think of something you told me. What I said? You know, when we, <laughs> you know, when you were, we were talking about poverty, and you said, you know, if you want to talk about poverty and you want to actually understand the issue, you have to talk about poverty without using the word poverty, low income or impoverished. Mm -hmm. Impoverished. You, if you, you cannot, you have a different conversation. Mm -hmm. you, if you say, the family that lives down the street and around the corner from me is poor, oh, I can't use the word poor. Mm -hmm. So I have to describe they are, um, they live without heat. Mm -hmm they earn less than yeah. a certain amount of money per year. Mm -hmm. They, it's a different conversation. Do we have to do the same thing when we're trying to talk about? Well, I think we also have to adjust very quickly. Look, this is a disorienting moment for all of us, my, myself included. Less disorienting for me because, um, I, you know, as I was suggesting, to be in the work that I do means that you're seeing things that other people are not seeing. So I think there were many people who, during the time that the, you know, President Obama was president, felt like, see, we're great. You know, I mean, we've arrived, and we're doing this thing, and we're post-racial. Even if they weren't all the way there, they were like, but you see, right? And, 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 and I was saying, ish, I mean, I see, <laughs> but, but here are all these very, very deep problems, right? So you know, voter suppression. I mean, the docket of the Legal Defense Fund was quite full, <laughs> even during the Obama years. If you think about the worst videos of, you know, police brutality that you've probably seen, maybe for some of you, seeing Eric Garner killed, choked on the street here in New York was the first time you've saw, seen a person killed. Maybe seeing Walter Scott shot in the back running in that park was the first time you saw somebody murdered. That didn't happen under Trump. So there were many of us who knew that there were deep fissures and deep problems that needed to be addressed in this country. And what troubles me about the, the conversation about diversity and inclusion, not that it's not an important and good thing, but that I think the moment that we're in has propelled us towards a much starker conversation, a much starker reckoning that we have to deal with. It doesn't mean that diversity and inclusion are off the table, but we're back at the point where we're, we're really at the nugget of the thing where the humanity of people of color is, is, is being questioned at the highest levels and quite publicly, right? Where the dignity mm -hmm. of members of the LGBTQ community is like right, the, right? So and we're the not- And safety. And the safety, that we're in a time of racial violence that is um, not at all unprecedented, but has not been what we have been living with for the last 20 years. So while it's important to talk about diversity and inclusion, we also have to be able to like reset that, th that we're in a little bit of a reset now where the conversation is, is pushing us towards a much starker reckoning of how we have to deal with, uh, with race. We, we missed our chance to do the nice thing around the edges. Mm -hmm. And we're now back at a place um, where we have to do the hard work. And the hard work requires exceptional courage because we have to be able to say things that make people uncomfortable 
and we have to be able to step out of our comfort zone. We have to be able to make decisions that are difficult for us to make, but that recognize that we're in an emergency situation. And uh, you know, the truth is, you know, I was in a restaurant in DC um, a couple months ago, and, and we were talking about the starkness of the moment with another colleague, and I and I was looking around the room, and people were laughing, and um, they were eating crab cakes, and it was quite beautiful. And I thought, you know. And, and people will still be eating like this. Like this restaurant will still be full. It won't be for everyone that it will be terrible. You know, people will be able to go on with the veneer of a life that is lovely, but we won't be a real democracy, right? Just like we weren't, I mean, all of this nostalgia about the 50s when we weren't a real democracy. I just, was just said we couldn't have been a real democracy, right? Because we kept whole segments of the population from participating in the political process and kept people as second class citizens and allowed people to be treated as subhuman. But many people have very fond memories, <laughs> right, of the, of the 40s and the 50s. So I just wanna be clear that like what it's requiring us to do is to really look beyond our own lives and to look out into the country and to decide what do you wanna hand off? What are we compelled to hand off? What are those of us, the lucky generations born after World War II, mm. something was given to us at tremendous sacrifice. Those of us in the post-civil um, rights movement, those of us in the post-women's rights movement, none of that stuff just fell out of the sky. It was real human sacrifice and courage. Um, and I think we're compelled to the same in this moment, and, and the question is, are we up for it? As we continue, I want to remind you, yes, take your applause. As we continue, I want to remind you that in your programs, you have question cards, and you can use those. Um, the ushers will be moving around, collecting your questions, so we can bring you into our conversation. And in about five minutes, we're going to actually take some of those questions, so please fill those out and, and pass them down to the ushers. You said that we have to get used to moving outside of our comfort zones, and we have to get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. We, that important word, mm -hmm. perhaps the most important word in the Constitution mm -hmm. in, um, in the work that we try to do. But when you talk about race, it's often a them conversation. Mm -hmm. Because our, com our, our, our collective notion about race is so often a conversation that's by, for, about people of color, um, often black people, uh, because we have a, na a narrow and perhaps all too binary concept of it being mm -hmm. a black and white concept. Um, so how do we move beyond that so that everyone feels like it's their work mm -hmm. and that it doesn't feel just like work but that understand the benefits of it. So when you talk about diversity programs, for instance, at university and you've been spending a lot of time today talking about um, campus environment, mm -hmm. diversity programs are usually seen as programs primarily that benefit underrepresented populations, specifically black, brown um, populations. Yeah. I would argue that if you're creating a generation of leaders, that they need comfort and courage and competence around issues of diversity and inclusion and race if you are going to be a leader. No matter what you do, you have to figure out how to help people row in the same direction when they don't, I didn't say if they don't agree with each other, when they don't agree with each other, and yet diversity programs do not look at the world through that lens. There's a big yeah. body of work from Deloitte and McKinsey and universities here and abroad that show that organizations that are diverse have better rates of retention. They post better profits. They are more productive. They're more innovative. I could go on and on and on, and yet we don't, through, we don't view diversity through that lens. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. There's actually a new book out by Pamela Newkirk. I think it's called Diversity, Inc. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a quite um, honest assessment of where our diversity efforts have actually gotten us, particularly in corporate America, which is not very far. But you raise a really, really critical, um, and I really recommend that book as well. Um, Adding to the syllabus. <laughs> I mean, if I can be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly amazed that we entrust uh, people with the idea of leadership and tremendous power who know absolutely nothing about race. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, so I just, <laughs> you know, I've been in these conversations, for example, with Facebook um, about the platform and, and, you know, I think strong and honest conversations. 
And, and one of the, 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 the first conversation I, I had um, with, with Sheryl Sandberg, you know, I, that, this is what I talked about. I talked about like what it means to build a public platform in the absence of embedded internal knowledge about the ways in which public spaces have been contested around race in this country. Um, we allow people to develop things and to have all this power. And like one of the things you don't have to know about is any of the history we just talked about. Like you could just, you could just be super, super wealthy. You could create a whole policy like stop and frisk. And then you could get it wrong and then years later you could just say, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. I mean this, I mean this is real. This is, we, we're all looking for leaders. There's a lot, there's a lot, no, no, seriously. There's a lot I don't know as a leader and I'm constantly learning and the difference is I know what I don't know. But what's interesting in, in you know, the path to leadership, one of the things that you learn about over and over again is understanding blind spots. Yes. And, and yet this is not. And yet it's not required, it's not. It's not even seen, I mean, we're in a process right now, we're gonna be evaluating people to be president. We're, you know, we're evaluating leaders all the time. You're gonna evaluate who the next mayor is. You're, what do we require of people who we think are going to lead? But let's be real, let's be real. Yes. There are also people who would be interested in entering the space and feel like they're barked out of it. If they lean in, they feel like they're engaging in cultural appropriation. They feel like if they step into the space, there are sometimes, there's some policing that goes on from communities of color. No question. That send, send the message that you don't belong here, that this is our conversation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like they're hearing two different things, mm -hmm. that you should be at the table and you should speak up at the table and you should participate, and yet we don't really want you to have a chair at this table because, so that is yeah. all going no, this, on this is, at the you, same time. You are time. absolutely right about this, and I do, I mean, I have to say it's one of my issues. It's like, do you know, what do we want from people, right? Do we want people to engage or do we not want people to engage? We yes. want people to engage. We have to make some space for them to, to engage. We also have to allow people to make mistakes yes. and to be able to learn from those mistakes. Yes. Um, there is a way to learn from your mistakes. There's a way to express humility and so forth. Um, but I think we have to make that space. But what I think is most important is that seat at the table is important not only for your own voice, but for the voice that you give to other people. It's like what, you know, it's, it actually is about lending your imprimatur to respecting the voices of people who are left out, right? So it's not just about you sitting at the table and saying all the right things, right? It is also about you're, you're trying to be honest about what it means to have a table from which some people have to be excluded. It's a table, right? So some people are gonna be excluded and what's my responsibility to make sure that somehow those voices play some role in the conversation we're having, in the decision making at the conversation, in the conversation. How do we, I ensure the humility of the people at the table so that we can at least every day recognize that it's not all here, we don't have all the answers. Um, so I, I just think that that's what I mean when I talk about leadership. I mean, first of all, knowing America is a very, very, particularly around race, is a very, very tricky thing. For myself, I always say that to, to try to understand race and the actual litigation that we do, it's part, economics, history, demography, political science, social psychology, that's all if I wanna just litigate a voting rights case, I gotta know all that stuff. I have to be able to put on an expert witnesses who are historians and who are political scientists and so forth. So it's a very uh, dynamic, multidisciplinary field and therefore I think people who want to engage in leadership have to expose themselves to some of this history and to some of this knowledge to even have the tools to be able to think through how do I lead in a country that is engaged in this dynamic exper experiment of being multiracial, of imagining equal protection of laws to all people in its borders, of constantly creating it, recreating itself by virtue of granting birthright citizenship. I mean, this is really tricky stuff and there isn't a model anywhere else in the world. We're doing this thing that is unusual, but you need the tools to be able to lead effectively. So I'd like to bring in some questions from the Please. audience. And this first one I think is spot on given that we are here at the Mellon Foundation 50th anniversary. Yes. What is the role of the arts and humanities in this precarious moment? Huge, huge. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been saying actually since 2016 that um, this, is the, this is the moment for the arts, you know. It's not the job of politics or law um, to do it all. 
you know, there is a role to be played by every sector of this society in bringing us to the place that we all want to get to. And actually, at a moment uh, in our country, like now, when our politics is largely failing us, <laughs> um, <coughs> law is holding on by a thin thread, um, this really is the artist moment. This really is the time when uh, what people are doing with film and what people are doing uh, with painting and with music um, and the way people are tapping into a shared humanity is actually doing more in many ways than we could ever do with a legal brief, right? It's, it's saying something. I, I said this about uh, Ava DuVernay's Central Park Five, right? That, that what that film does is more than we could ever do with a legal brief um, to, to allow you to tap into your, your being convicted yourself about inhumanity in our legal system. And more that you can do as a journalist in writing the first draft. Exactly, the story, exactly. Where so many got it wrong and now admit that. That's right. So this, so this, is, the artistic, this is the artistic moment, I think. And I don't think that's untrue. I, I was talking with a group of teenagers here uh, in, in New York, te a group called Teens Take Charge. They're amazing. They were at my office and I was talking to them about being in the 12th grade in my great books class with Lenore Van Ora and um, reading Greek classics, which I'd never heard of before, but I fell in love with them. And um, you know, I loved Agamemnon, and you know, Clytemnestra kills her husband, and it's the, this terrible, bloody scene. But I, was, I got her, like I understood where she was coming from. <laughs> and here's what I mean. And not that I thought murder was great, but, but I ended up writing this paper about honor and about women, and about you know, where was, there was no conduit for women to actually have honor in that system. And that high school teacher, you know, she didn't like call the police and say that I was crazy for writing this paper. She understood what I was getting at. And I've always said that that course, uh, trying to understand Clytemnestra, trying to understand Medea, actually was the early formation of my views, mm -hmm. actually, about the criminal justice system, about the death penalty. We represent people on death row um, who we believe you know, are entitled to fairness, who we believe still are human beings and entitled to dignity, um, that, mu that it was shaped by, by those experiences. So, I do think that the, the arts and humanities maybe even has a bigger outsized role at this moment than in times, less turbulent times. Which means the work of the Mellon Foundation is as important as it's been. Man, yes. So someone says, um, is there, hold on, you stated with the 14th Amendment, returning to it now, and thinking about its guarantee of equality, is it enough? Was it ever enough? and equality versus equity and wondering if there's a difference between those two things. Well, they're words. I mean, it's law, right? Law is words on the paper and then we have to give it meaning. So could it ever, you know, there's nothing that's written that's ever enough. It's, it's, it's we have to infuse it um, with that meaning and, and make it better. And that's the, you know, the, the great work that we do is to try to infuse those words um, so in your meaning. view, it's, it's not that the law is written in stone, law is more like a river and it flows and as it yes, flows, it Yes, and you have to contours. breathe, you have to, you have to breathe life into it or else it's just static words on the paper. Uh, you know, for many years- Because you know a lot of people don't believe that. What? That the law is, is written, there are people who believe that it is more, it was written in Well, stone, I mean, if, if they believe that, then they should question why the 14th Amendment was used for many, many years, mostly to protect corporate interests, when clearly that wasn't the purpose of the words on the paper, right? Somebody decided to breathe that life into it. So, <laughs> I mean, so that's the process. That The process is that we, 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 we shape it and we, we, we reinterpret it, interpret it again, uh, depend on our, depending on our understanding of what those words mean. Someone writes, my third eye as a token in rooms full of nice people. Even if exhausted, any words of encouragement? Say it again. Um, <laughs> I'm reading it directly. Mm -hmm. My third eye as a token in rooms full of nice people. Mm. Even if exhausted. So there's a lot there, yeah. right? Third Ooh, eye. That's like a haiku. That's token. Amazing. It really is. I was trying. To, I was trying to read it with the right brio. Yeah. Um, exhaustion. Yeah. Encouragement. Nice people. So first of all, I, yes, <laughs> I, I feel you. I've been there. Um, I actually find the experience of seeing things that other people don't see to be a very profoundly uh, satisfying experience, actually. I get it, it carries a lot of responsibility and you don't always wanna take up the responsibility and you don't always have to take up the responsibility. Some of this is for you, for you to 
to learn and, and, and think through. Um, I liked the point about being exhausted, which is it's not your job to crusade in every room. Uh, you don't have to all the time. Um, and sometimes it's just gently asking questions so that you make other people in the room do the work. It's, it's not that you have to lay out the whole curriculum. Every day is not your day to lay out the syllabus. Um, but sometimes it's just asking a question and then seeing what happens. You know what you know already. Um, and you know, I would say that at this moment in our country, we need some nice people. We do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we should prod nice people to be more than nice, you know, to be, to be nice and to yeah. be strong and courageous. Thank you. One of the things that I've learned um, in eavesdropping on people talking about race through the work mm -hmm. that I do at the Race Card Project and now researching and writing about a lot of this is we tend to think of race and inclusivity and inclus inc inclusivity and di diversity, um, the big words, we attach them to big events. Mm -hmm. But what pushes us forward are usually little, teeny, tiny decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, the decision to sit next to someone, mm -hmm. um, the decision to give a resume a different look, a second look, mm -hmm. you know, all these little teeny things. So if you just would spend what little bit of time we have left talking about the importance of the small things mm -hmm. in pushing that big rock up the hill. Well, the first thing is they take time. So that's, it goes back to the earlier conversation about speed being the enemy mm -hmm. of inclusivity and diversity. Um, you know, a lot of, we've, we've been doing a lot of cases lately challenging uh, the use of criminal backgrounds checks to um, bar people from employment. So uh, a number of cases where, you know, companies, anything shows up on your record, right? And, um, and you're dinged. They don't tell you why you're dinged. You don't know why you're dinged, but that's why you were dinged. Um, you know, knowing what most people now ha have available to them to know about race in the criminal justice system, the likelihood that somebody was just arrested um, improperly, um, someone convicted for a low-level drug offense many years ago. We represented a woman who was 58 years old, uh, had worked for the school system in Dallas for a number of years, retired, then decided she wanted to come back and be, <clears throat> excuse me, a school crossing guard. And um, now Dallas had a criminal backgrounds check, and she went through the criminal backgrounds check. And what came up was an assault charge from when she was 18, mm -hmm. when she had a fight with another girl. And she was denied the job. So slowing that thing down and um, not using shortcuts to recognize the humanity of people. There is no shortcut to recognize the humanity of people. There just isn't. There are shortcuts to categorize people, but there are not shortcuts to understanding that someone is a full human being. And that means I'm not asking people to, to uh, throw away their cell phones. I'm not throwing mine away. Um, or to not use technology or anything like that. But I am asking people to slow it down when you're in a decision-making position. That could mean when you're standing in front of a classroom and a student asks you a question before you just start answering it the way you're gonna, just pause for a second. Likewise, when you were gonna ask the question, slow it down. Um, so just the presumptions that we're making so quickly um, is so corrosive at this moment. And that means we have to demand it of others. We have to demand it of media. You guys have to slow down um, so that we can learn. And that's hard because everyone's reporting in the moment. That's right. You know, putting it out on the Twitter. That's right. Even before you put it out. That's right. On the air in the newspaper. But I like that. And that's perhaps a good moment for us to end, mm -hmm. to slow it down. Slow down. It takes time. Thank you very much. Sarah.